And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Richard Henry Dana's Two Years Before the Mass, starring Edmund O'Brien. A thin, pale young man stands at the library window and blinks his eyes at the sunlight streaming through the glass. He has stood thus often, listening to his father debate the capabilities of President Andrew Jackson, the affairs of the city of Boston, and the problems of rearing a son without the aid of a mother. Richard Henry Dana, Jr. listens this afternoon and smiles across the room at Sarah. Sarah, so young and understanding. Richard, the whole project is unbecoming of a Dana. You're a gentleman. August 16th, 1834. The brig Pilgrim, Captain Thompson commanding, is now at sea. I came aboard dressed in the checked shirt, the duck trousers, and varnished black hat of the seasoned sailor. But I found it takes more than correct costume to fool a real seaman. Hey, Lance, look at those softy white hands and the dancing school way he walks. Boys, we've got a gentleman in the book. <laughs> I laughed with them. And by the time we had dropped down Boston Bay, we were all friends. This evening, the crew was called aft, and Captain Thompson surveyed us, cigar in mouth. Men, we've begun a long voyage. I was in the starboard watch, so I remained on deck. The night was clear and moonlit. There was no sound except the creaking of the rigging and the swash of the sea. Above me, and extending far out over the gunwales, rose cloud upon cloud of gleaming white sail, towering up until they seemed almost to touch the stars. For the first time, I was lonely. Boston, Harvard, my past life and friends, all were flowing away from me like the silent wake of the ship. Shortly before my watch ended, the moon went behind the clouds, the wind freshened, and long, heavy swells began to roll under the bows. I felt them very definitely in my stomach. No, you don't. You ain't going below yet. One huge hand had me by the collar and was dragging me back onto the yard. What's the matter, mate? Seasick. You'll get over it. Sam, you, you saved my life. A word of advice, mate. Don't let the boys hear you say that. You're Jack Carr now. No thankies and no shivering in your boots. Whatever happens, we make it a big joke. Yes, I understand. Then get in sail. October 1st. Crossed the equator in longitude 24 degrees, 24 minutes west. My eyes are much improved, and my whole health. All this on a diet of salt beef, hard tack, and tea. November 17th, another storm. Awakened from sleep by the cry most dreaded at sea. It was George Balmer, the happy-go-lucky English boy. We lowered the quarter boat and searched for an hour, though we knew it was hopeless. No talking or smiling in the forecastle tonight. January 14th, 1835. Provisions had all but given out. The crew was nervous and grumbling. And then this morning, we made land. Santa Barbara, California, 150 days out of Boston. We lined the railing and stared at the distant beach and the belfry of the mission of Santa Barbara. March 11th. After touching at Santa Barbara, we sailed north to Monterey, the headquarters of the Governor General. Here, the Mexican customs officers came aboard and inspected the cargo which we had brought to sell. And sell we did. 
Then began our loading of the hides and the trouble with the captain. First he denied us our Sunday day of rest. Then one wet evening he called the crew on deck to stand about all night in the rain, simply to watch it rain, as he put it. This morning I was standing by the main hatchway. I heard the sound of blows behind me. Then the captain shouting at Sam. I like to do it! Simpson, I'm going to do something about the sort of thing we saw today. Yes. California. A corner of the world the Lord has forgotten and the devil wouldn't have. We're 16,000 watery miles from anybody or any law that can help us. But we've got to believe, Stimson. We've got to keep telling ourselves when we get home. When we get home. I'll get there, Stimson. I've got to. California, the crew of the brig Pilgrim toiled through the months to collect a cargo of bullock hides. One year before, Richard Dana had shipped as a sickly young Boston gentleman with failing eyesight. Now he labored from dawn till dusk, curing hides on the beach, carrying them through the surf, rowing them to the ship, stowing them in the hold, and with it all, still had the energy to make entries in his journal. July 8th, 1835. Today, another ship came to port, and with it, mail from Boston. As I devoured the lines written so many months ago by my father and by Sarah, I was swept with homesickness and a loathing of the monotony and tyranny of my present life. It was a feeling shared by others in the forecastle. Meads, make up your minds to this. December 4th, 1835, aboard the Alert. We coasted north from Santa Barbara, intending to take on more hides at Monterey. But meeting a storm, we were blown off course and have now put into the bay of San Francisco. The Mexicans have a garrison here, the Presidio, and at some distance is the Mission Dolores. The one other habitation at San Francisco is a board shanty built by a Yankee trader who deals with the Indians. A large number of deer abound on the hills. The bay itself is enormous, and there is an island of rock near its entrance called Alcatraz. April 15th, 1836. Southward again to San Diego, where we dropped anchor alongside the brig Pilgrim. I met my old friends Sam and John the Swede and Stimson. They are as happy to be free of Captain Thompson as I am unhappy to be still with him. This evening, that gentleman... our last day in California. At noon, all hands came above and stood about, waiting for the breeze to rise. The captain and the mate stationed themselves aft and stared to windward. The moment was almost here, for which I had waited 16 long months. Dana. Yes. July 1st. We are now nearly up to Cape Horn. From captain down to cook, all are uneasy, for July is the worst month of the year to attempt Cape Horn. July 3rd, the sun rose at 9 and set at 3, 18 hours of darkness. Today, while I was standing my trick at the helm, I heard the lookout call from the rigging. Independence Day in Boston. What firing of guns and ringing of bells there must be. The hot July sun and ice cream for all. 
But down here, only ice. Miles upon miles of field ice and towering icebergs that dwarf our ship into a child's toy. July 14th. The deck is covered with snow, the sails solid ice, the wind a steady bombardment of hail. The hull has sprung a leak in the forecastle. No dry berths for us and no dry clothing for two weeks past. We've tried Cape Horn twice and failed. September 26th, 1836. This evening, the ship Alert comes to Hull Wharf in Boston Harbor. So ends this journal and my two years before the mast. The time has come to make good use of both. Dana Jr., attorney at law. I love you as passionately as the seaman loves the sea, as surely as the tides upon it, and as eternally as the North Star above it. Sarah, I love you. Music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray and Bernard Herman.